morning, everyone. All right, so it's a pleasure to join. It's a pleasure to join you on behalf of St. Louis Public Radio. St. Louis Public Radio is proud to continue its support of the DEI conference to help amplify its powerful dialogues and messages. And our first session today is very powerful indeed. Titled The Ripple Effect, Gun Violence, Community Trauma and Healing, this panel discussion will examine gun violence and its traumatic impact on our communities, schools, and families. This session brings together some of the region's foremost experts to discuss their approaches to community-based trauma healing. Gun violence is not and must not be regarded as an over there issue. It's here, it's everywhere. This is a hard and heavy topic to face, but it's one we must turn toward, not away from. A word of caution for our listeners, this session will contain discussion of gun violence and its traumatic impact. Please take care of your, in your participation if these topics are personally sensitive or triggering for you. To moderate our discussion, please welcome Webster's own Dr. Muthoni Musangali, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Professional Counseling. Dr. Musangali is joined here today um, with Dr. Kelvin Adams, who's the recently retired superintendent of St. Louis Public Schools, as well as uh, Dr. Stephen Player, vice president of DEI for BJC Healthcare. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to have everybody here. Thank you very much for joining us. I want to start by thanking our panelists. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have uh, distinguished uh, experts who will bring their expertise, their experience um, in the St. Louis region uh, to this really, really important topic, uh, talking about gun violence, community trauma, and healing. So I want to start off with a question for, um, for Dr. Adams. Uh, first of all, when you think about uh, gun violence, uh, Oftentimes, our minds go to incidents of mass shooting, and uh, all of the. Unfortunately, there's very many of those. We have one just about every day now. Um, so our minds go to incidents of mass shooting, uh, and yet when you come to um, our city, our, our, our state, Missouri, we are ranked uh, 47th. Uh, we are almost at the bottom in the nation for gun safety. Behind all of those statistics, however, are real people, communities. Can you talk about why this matters? Why is this conversation important for us here beyond the statistics? First of all, good, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Uh, first of all, good morning and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I taped the six o'clock news last night, uh, Channel 5, and at the top of the news were three stories. The first story was, um, a gentleman shot on Tucker Street, ex ex execution-style uh, shooting at 10 o'clock in the morning. A uh, homeless man shot in the head um, on video. Uh, 15 year old student shot and killed in the Sumner neighborhood and area. Mm -hmm. And then a group of my former students uh, in Jefferson City advocating for the notion of gun violence after the shooting some um, 120 days after the shooting on October 24th at 9.05 at CVPA, Central Visual Performing Arts and Collegiate School of Medicine. So your question is an appropriate question to ask. Uh, why is it important? It's important because our young people and our community is, in, uh, is dealing with the notion of violence, especially from guns, on a regular basis. And so we have to come up with a better strategy to try to address it. Okay. You articulated um, the notion of um, mass shootings that almost seem to happen every single day. Uh, in our community. And so as a, as a community, mm -hmm. we have to think strategically around how to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, Tutu said, we have to stop thinking about uh, pulling people out of the river and have to go upstream to find out why they're falling into the river. And that's kind of what we have to think about as we, as we think about gun violence. It's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. um, guns will not go away. And our ability to monitor them and to um, uh, cur cur curtail, if you will, uh, how guns are used in our community does not seem uh, that it's going to go away. So the real question becomes is how do we navigate the issue of gun safety and support young people as they have to um, deal with what happens when um, 
they encounter persons with guns. And so I think it's an appropriate topic. I think it's something that we have to be strategically uh, to think about uh, in terms of how to deal with it. Uh, and we can't un, um, somebody's told me, you can't unwatch a video. In other words, once you see it, it's there forever. And that's what our young people are dealing with on a regular basis mm -hmm. in their communities um, and also what they see on, in, in, uh, on television and other places. Mm -hmm. I'm struck by your reference to the Central and Performing Arts uh, shooting in October. You mentioned it to the t specific time that it happened. Um, talk to us a little bit about that, what, what that has meant for our community. Well, I think um, from a student perspective, because I've obviously had a lot of conversations with a lot of students, and they uh, are still traumatized. I think people, you watch the news, you see it for two or three weeks, and you walk away, and you think it goes away. Uh, but our young people are dealing with it on a regular basis. There are kids who never came back to the school and would never walk back in that building again. Uh, there were parents who were saying that um, uh, uh, deeply into counseling. Uh, one of my security guards is deep into counseling right now as a result of this, and likely will be in counseling for a very long period of time because you can't walk away from it. Um, I, I, I think um, the, the challenge for us is to... Um, see this as, I guess the best way to put it is the kids went to Jefferson City yesterday and the theme of their talk was, what would happen if that was your kid? That was the theme to Jefferson mm -hmm. City and to the uh, legislators there. What would happen if it was your kid? And I think that's the theme that has to be a theme for all of us as we encounter this notion of uh, gun safety and gun violence. It's, 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 it's seared into my memory October 24th at 9.05, because that's the time I received a call relative to this, and it's a day and time I would never forget, ever, 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 ever forget, uh, because how it happened. I think sometimes, especially in the African-American community, there's a belief that the, the least of the mass shootings kinds of things could never happen in our communities. It can't happen in St. Louis. It can't happen in the city of St. Louis. It can't happen close to us. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, it does, it has, and it will continue. Um, my board president asked me before this happened, um, what can we do about um, this notion of uh, mass shootings or gun safety, I said, the question is not um, if it's going to happen, the question is when is it going to happen? Mm -hmm. It's not a question of if, it's when. It's not that I'm not being, um, uh, I'm being negative about it, it's just that the reality, of the, the, the prevalence of guns in our community mm -hmm. makes it almost, um, it, it's, it's just gonna happen. Um, I received a call from a colleague on yesterday um, and asked me a question, uh, where did we get our clear book bags from? because she had two elementary kids who brought toy guns to school and she wanted to have some book bags that were clear to try to make sure that people could see what was going on. But kids are, are, are taking toy guns and other kinds of guns as if they're like pencils and paper uh, and bringing them to school for show and tell and those kinds of things. So um, I, I don't know that we walk away from this issue. I think we're gonna have to find a way to navigate and, um, and, and, and work to support young people in our community around guns. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Player, uh, being at BJC, uh, and I think about where BJC is located on Kings Highway uh, in St. Louis. Uh, so again, thinking about gun violence and the idea that um, our minds often go to incidents like the CVP incident last year and a lot of other incidents of mass shooting. However, data seems to indicate that almost um, less than 2% of gun violence is related to incidents of uh, mass shooting. So we're talking about about 98% of gun-related violence is the result of gun violence in communities, person to person that is not really reported, is not sensationalized, we don't really hear much about it. Uh, what is this like for BJC being where you are? Uh, good morning, thank you, first of all, and thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to share perspective and hopefully um, bring forward the voice of our teams that are out there at this moment meeting with our patients and their families in their homes, in the communities, in our emergency room settings and healthcare settings every day. Um, when, when I think about the question you ask, there's data also that reflects that just over 20% of gun fatalities, gun uh, violence, 
and erroneous um, gun incidences, shooting incidences, occurred through um, uh, with guns that are don't have gun locks, right? And so there's an educational component too, while trying to honor everyone's uh, amendment right to own guns, but there's an educational component too. What that means for healthcare, BJC, SSM, Mercy, tenant, right? Because this has to have a collective impact. Uh, we have to support cross-functionally. We've got to break barriers uh, and work together in this space. Everything you see, uh, as, as Dr. Adams just shared, everything you see every day happens at our campus, at Cardinal Glennon, at SLU, the four St. Louis Children's Hospital, the four level one trauma centers in the heart of the city. Mm -hmm. We see it every day. And individuals, uh, understandably, migrate directly to uh, the, the patient, the victim. But there's a compounding impact with every case that, that occurs. There's the family, there's the friends, there's the neighborhood, there's the community, right? Everyone is impacted by this violence and yet it perpetuates. Hey, Mr. Clark. Welcome. Uh, and on top of that, we have the healthcare providers that are seeing this again and again and again so when you are re-traumatized on a daily basis, mm -hmm. how do you effectively come in and care for those individuals in their most dire state without having any lenses of bias, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so we're very fortunate to have caseworkers and social workers specifically focused on patients and their families when they arrive. We work with agencies like Mr. Clark here with Cure Violence. We have Life Outside of Violence, Victims of Violence programs that tie the resources from a consultative support as well as a de-escalation component because that incidence oftentimes doesn't end right there. There's a recidivism. There's a potential for retaliation, right? All of that comes in to play. And so for me and my role with my colleagues across the system is how do we ensure that empathetic approach with everyone that comes into our organization every day without those lenses of bias? A lot of that gets to a, a, a very successful uh, local organization, Alive and Well, that does trauma-informed uh, training, right? Our caseworkers, social work, even our community health advocacy and outreach does ride-alongs with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police, right, to help coach how to respond to some of these incidences that are really driven around social determinants of health at the end of the day, that are really garnered or are sort of grounded in um, some of these challenges that aren't rooted necessarily in violence and the intent to do violence, but really a cry for help. Uh, and so uh, I'll get off the mic so you can ask the next question, but you know, listen to the question even you posed initially, how did we get here? How did we get here as a community, as a country? While we try to honor progress with technology, everything is accessible now, right? Uh, and having a, a, a really good conversation before this, when did our response, uh, and conflict go directly to a, a handgun as opposed to a verbal uh, response, mm -hmm. right? Everything is out on social media. Third person shooter games, kids starting at two, three, four years old. And if you don't think that that plays into the psyche of a child that doesn't have the wraparound support oftentimes at their times in need, and on top of that, a pandemic and a crisis with physical isolation and the only dependency is social and the bullying that happens and it's compounded with all these other influences, that's a recipe for what we're getting today. Thank you very much. I want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Mr. James Clark. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and I'm going to 
introduce, uh, invite you with a question. Uh, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about, um, as we're talking about this, we just talked that uh, less than 2% of gun violence is, uh, gun-related violence is the result of mass shootings. We're talking about the day-to-day -day inst instances, such as what uh, Dr. Adams just shared, uh, the incidents that happened just yesterday. When you read the news, when you look at the news out, uh, media outlets, every day in St. Louis, there are things happening. How has this shaped our streets, our neighborhoods? What impact has this had at the neighborhood level and how people live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, thank you for having me, first of all, and I'm honored to be on a panel with such an esteemed uh, group. Uh, uh, when you look at what is going on in the St. Louis metropolitan area and really in every urban core, mm -hmm. uh, gun violence has always been at the crisis level. But to your point, it did not prick the consciousness until there was a mass shooting. You know, I've been working at the neighborhood level for over 30 years, and I deal with gun violence each and every day. And I got frustrated, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I would get calls from mothers. Um, my son was killed and there was no outcry. Mm -hmm. My daughter was shot and it didn't even make the news, Mr. Clark. So, so we, have, we have been slow to respond. It is a daily issue, but for whatever reason, we refuse to take the deep dive. It's very comfortable and it's very convenient to do a sound bite after, after a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. And any loss of life is something that, sh that is very, very precious, but we overlook it each and every day. Now mm -hmm. it has risen to the point where we can no longer ignore it because it's happening now and it was very, very predictable. Mm -hmm. It's going to uh, happen with younger and younger people and is going to begin to show up in some most some of the most inconvenient places like a downtown mm -hmm. like a foundry and we haven't even walked we we haven't even gotten into the spring and summer um so so we have some very real challenges ahead of us but our biggest challenge is to focus the resources at the neighborhood level when you talk about system reform, and, and we do need system reform in the courts, in the judicial system, um, in politics, we do need system reforms, mm -hmm. but we need system, the neighborhood is a system. The neighborhood is a system. Families are systems, and we have broken families in broken neighborhoods, and this is the end result. And um, we have some real starch challenges ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So I will follow up with that question about the, so you have a neighborhood, I read about the neighborhood porch living room initiative. And it brings to my mind uh, the idea that I think about within neighborhoods, when you're going down to the root, to the very root, to where the people are, the individuals that make up a community, and the porch traditionally was a place of safety, a place where at the end of the day people sat, they talked after a hard, hard day's work, and, and that the safety that would have been associated with a porch um, is, has eluded us now because you have drive-by shootings. You have having to think twice about, can I really sit on my porch, right? Think about a place like a school where those places that were safe before places where we went to seek refuge and safety, that that safety is no longer there. Think about churches uh, and how we have lost a sense of safety because again, it appears that gun violence can occur anywhere at any time. How do we deal with the, the on, uh, sort of the constant threat um, and how can we restore safety in places that were uh, places of refuge that no longer are? Well, first we have got to understand that there's no quick fix. And right now, we are not present at the root. Um, at the Urban League, in the Division of Public Safety, we take corrective actions through our lens, which is the NPL, the neighborhood. Are our programs active in the neighborhood? And we use crime data to select our our uh, neighborhoods 
Are we present on the front porch? Are our urban engagement specialists on the front porch? And is our information reaching the living rooms? And are we getting a clear picture of what is taking place in the living rooms? And are we challenging the behavior that's fostered in the living room? See, you can't challenge it by sending a kid into detention. You can't challenge it by locking a kid up. It starts in the neighborhood. And so we have a very unique lens. So we are literally five to seven years ahead of what the current situation is. I saw 13-year-olds shooting and killing 15-year-olds five years ago. Why? Because I'm in the living room and I'm watching the behavior and I'm saying in the next five years, this kid is going to be able to walk out that front door unsupervised. And so now we have to go all the way back and we and we really got to stop doing social science and get back to social service. Now we're doing social science. We want to analyze. We we, we uh, want to um, uh, come up with an evidence-based practice. The evidence is what we've been doing in theory is not working. We went from social service to social science probably in the early 70s, where when James Clark grew up in the Jeff Vandaloo neighborhood, we had social programs that were administered by the older men and women that lived in the neighborhood. So we knew them. One year, the African-American young men and women who oversaw the softball games, who oversaw us doing kickball, right there in the JVL neighborhood, were replaced by white college students. And they said, Mr. Clark, now you all have got to sign in. Why we got to sign in? Well, because we have to turn in an attendance sheet to the funder. We don't want to sign in. And man, we don't know you. What happened to Dadu? Dadu used to supervise us. So they said, if you don't sign in, you can't come. We can't come. Now that's when we started smoking weed because we could no longer go to the program. So I saw this thing up close and personal, how the transition occurred. But in order to restore civility in St. Louis and in every major court, it's going to start in the neighborhoods, on the front porch, and in the living room. We've got to take a much deeper dive. And the quicker we can apply the solution, the quicker we will come out from under this reality. But if we don't apply the solution, it gets more and more diabolical. So, so can I jump in a little bit? Yes, of um, course. I, I'm going to agree with James, and I'm going to disagree with James. And, 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 and let me frame what I mean by that. James is 100% correct. It has to start in the neighborhood. But I would take it a step further. It has to start on an individual basis in the neighborhood with individual kids who show already a propensity to be violent in terms of how they respond and react. If I ask all of you in this audience to raise your hand and identify, if you could tell me, uh, raise your hand if you had a mentor that supported you when you were coming through school. I can almost guarantee there was some teacher, there was some coach, there was some advocate who saw something in you, reached down, and found it to help you get where you are today. There are some young people that the neighborhood in and of itself, as large as it is, uh, will need some level of mentorship to kids that are in dire straits. The young person who did the shooting at CVPA was a kid that if a mentor had been provided to that kid, I'm almost positive that the incident would not have occurred. I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive. And so we have to think differently around the neighborhood piece by making sure that we have adults who are reaching out and touching young people in a very direct way such that they can change the trajectory that they are already on. We know that already. We, we know it without a shadow of doubt. James talked about it. 13 year olds homes that he how homes that he's been in that he could tell that this 13 year old kid is going to end up in a very bad place. There is no if and buts about it. What's the intervention? It's not the neighborhood all by itself. It's an individual who will reach out when he talked about Dabu. Dabu was somebody in that neighborhood that somebody could respect. Those kinds of people don't exist anymore in the neighborhoods that are places where the kinds of shootings are taking places. Uh, and, I, and I said this to a colleague, teachers used to be advocates in a sense that they would reach out and do things in an extraordinary way. Teachers are not doing that anymore. 
um, with the notion of um, uh, the, the cultural wars that are going on, teachers don't feel comfortable exerting themselves in a way that they once did before because they're being questioned about what they think, what they say to kids. And so we have to think differently around this notion of neighborhood because it, in some cases it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation, a mentorship, one-on-five, one-on-ten. That's the kinds of things that will change the trajectory of the young people committing some of the kind of acts that are taking place. Guns don't shoot themselves. They don't shoot themselves. Somebody pulls the trigger that somebody is somebody who believes that they have a right to do so, and without intervention to support them, to help them understand they don't, then they're going to continue to do what they're doing. No, no matter what we say on this stage, no matter what we do, all we're simply doing is trying to address the issues as they're already presented. The question becomes, how do we get in front of this? And we can't get in front of it unless we spend some time with the young people that are committing the kinds of acts that are taking place in our community. Now, you say that the people that served as mentors uh, or that would be a coach uh, that would have identified that this, you know, a child may be on a tra trajectory that may lead them into poor outcomes. Where are these people? Where do they go? What happened to them? That, I, I was going to just say, that's the challenge. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. When, when I put out there earlier, how did we get here? Mm -hmm. How did we disassociate ourselves from the community in which we live? Mm -hmm. And that, tra that, that transition from home to work or whatever is just a transactional move and not an investment. And we expect something different, right? And so bringing up, because this is multi-generational, mm -hmm. this is multi-generational, bringing up the current and, and future generations mm -hmm to impart in them the importance of giving back in the community from which you came in the community that you are in, in today, right? There is a disassociation that's happening and, and that, that connection is not uh, being forged because immediately I thought about, you know, when I started coaching my son who's turning 21 this month when he was four in baseball, soccer, football, right? And, you know, you approach kids differently. And to have many parents just use that as an opportunity to drop the kids and go, and, and you know, that's a challenge in and of itself. Kids want to feel invested and supported and appreciated by those that are closest to them. So be there, show up. But there's the extended family that becomes the coaches and the other parents that wrap around. And so as a coach, when you're talking and redirecting kids, right, you have parents that don't talk to my child like that. Okay, so now you're imparting in that child beyond their own self-empowerment, right? Now they're thinking, I can do what I want to do. It's, Either A, someone's going to come and tell them, let them do, right? Rather than be recorrected, right? And to be invested in. And that perpetuates. Being a teacher is a, is a calling, okay? And we are not supporting our educators as much as we need to to expect something different from what we're seeing today. We need our teachers to be fully invested in our students, to be able to redirect, to be able to have the resources and control of their classrooms, the support of the family and extended family outside of that to, to uh, double down on some of those challenges. But we've got to show up too, right, as parents and communities to the parent-teacher conferences, right? We can't just show up when my son has something happen, now I wanna go off on the school, mm -hmm. okay? Right. Let, let's get back to the root, the root of the problem. And I think it is, you know, you have a set of generation that's afraid of the current generation, right? And so trying to commit their time and their talents and treasures to coach and mentor, right, uh, seems almost insurmountable with the challenges they face and then you have a younger generation that's let me get out and get mine mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, and, and that bootstrap mentality uh, and so we've got to reinforce the importance of giving back at all levels and just because there's all the data that shows having a male present in a child's life especially a male child's life changes their trajectory that doesn't mean it has to be that individual's biological father. Mm -hmm. 
And this is where teachers would be integral in, in this process. Uh, you'd have had a teacher that is consistent or a, a place that was consistent. That's why I'm sort of going to the idea of the school closures and even just our neighborhoods that have been abandoned. When you look at the St. Louis region, for example, um, you have schools closing and a school represents community, right? So when a school closes, it's not just as simple as these kids will be bused to another school building. It's the loss of an entire gathering or central point, right? A, a, a whole infrastructure that would have been, uh, that would have previously supported these uh, kids of over over the course of their lifetimes. Uh, but we, without that now, uh, we also have funding, uh, a funding system that is tied to property taxes. So this cyclical nature of, of the issue where you have, you know, as people leave the city, uh, buildings are abandoned, you don't have enough of a tax base to support the schools. Uh, and so where do, where do these people come from? You have teachers then who are not going to be paid uh, considerably compared to if they could go out to the county or some other school district, right? So then you have a high turnover of teachers. So it seems to be just sort of this cycle of, of, of things that's never ending. At what point then can we interject? Where do we try to attack the issue? I know that's a really hard thing to think about because it's, yeah, it's hard, you talk about the yeah. personal, but then there's it's also all these other systemic to, issues, right? I don't think it's a hard thing to think about. I think it's a hard thing to wrap your head around because it's multifactorial. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, you've got to take a collective impact approach and it's not just one way of doing that. Uh, and that's what makes it seems for some extremely daunting. And so when mm -hmm. something is seemingly daunting individual has a choice point. Either I commit and go all the way in or that's not for me. Somebody else needs to pick up that uh, and go with it. And that's where we're losing mm -hmm. out. That's loss of sense of pride in your community because now, you know, you're losing that infrastructure, right? The schools where students used to walk to school, mm -hmm. right? And you would have latchkey kids, right? And so the community watched those kids and made sure they were safe. And you know, uh, now we've got kids all over. I, I was a product of volunteer transfer. I went to St. Louis Public Schools all the way up until high school, right? And then participated in the voluntary transfer. And at the time, we thought it was really good. It was a really great opportunity to exchange. You know, a student of color could go out to the county. Uh, white students could come into the magnet program. But we didn't realize what, how that was degrading the infrastructure of the community at the time. Mm -hmm. Because now you got all these parents wanting to send their students out. And at the same time, this commercialized and smart life, there, there are certain schools that you know, St. Louis, that's the first question you ask, okay? And so I'm not gonna put any school on blast here, but you know, you have kids that are grown up that have athletic prowess that would normally go to their local high school now being picked and plucked and placed out in these other schools. And so now all that pride goes down, the student, now everybody wants to go where that talent is so mm -hmm. they can be, right? And so then that degrades, uh, you know, the potential talent pool, you still have the, you know, other students there that are trying to figure out, hey, where's my sense of pride, mm -hmm. right? My community, where's my sense of pride? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Adams can speak to it way better than I can, but being a product of that and, you know, knowing the intent was to provide me with, you know, great opportunities that would help me navigate the world, right? I didn't realize as a kid how much of a disservice that had done, right? Mm -hmm. I actually led me to say, get me out of St. Louis. Right, mm -hmm. but it's also right. I came back and fully committed to giving everything that I can in every space that I am mm -hmm. in to uh, create some improvement. Mm -hmm. So, I invite Dr. Adams to share your thoughts on that based on your experience. Well, I think, from a student perspective, he spoke um, better to it than I probably could. Uh, frankly, just from a data perspective, uh, there were 900,000 students in the St. Louis Public School District. Um, I mean, 900,000 people in the city, 115,000 uh, student population. Uh, that number of students who uh, take advantage of public education right now is about 35,000 students. Uh, so you can see what the number difference is as a result of over 40 schools that closed since the year 2000. 
Um, I've closed 23 schools myself as superintendent over the last 14 years. Uh, and it becomes, as he indicated, it's a, it's a cyclical, cyclical issue. It's not one isolated issue. And it does uh, impact neighborhoods. Schools, unfortunately, unfortunately, become the hub of that particular neighborhood. Uh, we have right now, at least when I was superintendent, 20 vacant buildings trying to be sold right now in neighborhoods, and they de degrade the neighborhood because those buildings are vacant. People move out of those homes that are close to them. Uh, they have to put kids on buses to bring all the way across town. Uh, we spent $20, 20 million a year, 20, really, when I left, $25 million a year just on transporting kids and had 300 routes that were running across the city. Um, and so it is a, a, a real challenge, and it can't be solved, mm -hmm. uh, as he indicated before, with just fixing one thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to take an uh, entire community working together to make really tough decisions around whether to invest money. Uh, where to, uh, how, how do we look at uh, how, how do we support a particular community, whether it's in North St. Louis or South St. Louis? We have to think strategically about how to look to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, a serious challenge. The VIC program was set up to try to uh, increase the notion of um, giving kids access to better quality education uh, at, at, its, at, its, at its height. Well, I, I'll just use the recent data. There are about 4,500 uh, African-American students who go to the county every single day on buses, there are only about 25 Caucasian kids that come to the city. Hmm. And so it was never set up in a way that would uh, be equal in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so it was always a brain drain and a cash drain for dollars going to the county as opposed to the city. Mm -hmm. And it has created the kind of dynamic that exists today uh, from a schooling perspective. But I, I would uh, venture to say, and James could speak better to this because he's a historian in the sense that he has lived in the city all his life and is working in an area that we are obviously talking about today, I would venture to say that it's kind of created the kind of dynamic that exists today where you have the kind of violence taking place in certain neighborhoods at a high level because you don't have a school there, you don't have a neighborhood there. In New Orleans, we call it the jack o lantern effect after, after uh, Katrina, uh, meaning you have a house with lights on here and five houses down you don't have another house with lights on again. And it's a jack o lantern effect, meaning you have some homes and neighborhoods and, and you have vacant land that surrounds those places and people are actually still trying to live in those places and they have no access to anything. And you put them in a position where they have to have a gun <laughs> to protect themselves. And we get mad because people have guns. They need to have guns to protect themselves. And that's what the kids would tell me on a regular basis. Look, I, I got to have a gun because I got to go down this street all by myself mm -hmm. at 8 o'clock coming from basketball practice, and there are no houses on this street. My mama lives all the way down there. And so I, I think it's, it's a bigger challenge than we could solve as we sit here and talk today. Uh, there really has to be some tough decisions around uh, where we have schools, where we have homes, um, and what a community really looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm fearful after doing this for 14 years that, that we don't have people willing to make the kind of tough decisions to do that. That's kind of where I sit at this place because I don't, I don't have a job like these two gentlemen have anymore. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and I don't have to bite my tongue regarding that. But, but I just don't believe that we have the kind of uh, leadership that's necessary to make the really tough decisions. We have to make some tough decisions in this city if we're going to change the dynamics of what happens. We, we, we're going to have to do it, and that's going to not make everybody happy um, from the university level all the way down to the street level. But we're going to have to make some tough decisions if we want St. Louis to survive. Um, when I arrived here with 309,000 people, right now that number is less than 300,000, and it's declining on a regular basis. And so um, St. Louis is a... Um, a big city with a, I mean, it's a small city with a big city mindset, and it can't continue to survive that way. Mm -hmm. Why, that's mind blowing when I think about it. Um, you, you you mentioned earlier that the the children, uh, the kids at CVP went to Jefferson City yesterday uh, and, and asked their legislators, "What would you do if this was your kid?" Right, and this brings me to thinking about when is a problem a problem. Why have we not, why do we not have the sustained focus and attention to these kinds of issues? Unless you have organizations like the Urban, uh, Urban League, for example, doing the work that they're doing. But it's almost like we're depending on the goodwill of, of people like yourselves, organizations like Urban League. Why is this not a problem? Is it because it doesn't affect white America? And is it because it's a, a black and brown people problem that it affects us? And so we, the, the powers that be don't necessarily identify these as something that needs 
attention and resources. Uh, and it's frustrating to think about. So what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Just as we mentioned earlier, 2% uh, of gun violence is the mass shootings. But it's not looked at until it's a mass shooting. Mm -hmm. Gun violence happens every day. Um, you could take that across the board. The urban core has been crying out for decades, but it has not become a priority. We have overlooked the cry of the families trapped in the urban core. Why is that? Uh, because it's not a priority. It's 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 not popularized. It's not a it's not a popular narrative. People leaders tend to jump on what's popular, um, and just as uh, Dr. Adams said. No one wants to make the tough decisions. No one wants to come out and say, we've got to focus at the neighborhood level. Mm -hmm. Because now it's popular to study, it's popular to analyze, it's, it's popular to come up with a, um, with a focus group to look at something. You know, I had the pleasure of working in the mayor's office for four years under Mayor Freeman Mosley Jr. And in 1993, he commissioned a disparity study and a large group of people sat down and they met for months and I attended every meeting and they were talking about crime and violence and um, education and health care. And I was like, we are really about to fix this. That's the same thing I did. I laughed at it. After reading the document through and through, right? This was in 93. It was a very thorough document full of data and charts and all of the disparities. And then every year, another entity commissioned a study pointed to the <laughs> same issues, the same side of town, the same variables, the same charts, but now it was spreading. It used to just be in North St. Louis in 1993. Then it spread into South St. Louis. Then it jumped into North County. And now we have an entire region that's being plagued because we refuse to take the step into the neighborhood, onto the front porch, and into the living room. St. Louis, we should be more like Seattle. Seattle, they have a violence problem. They have a gun violence problem. We should be more like Denver. Gun violence is an issue in Denver. But the fact that you say St. Louis and you say one of the most dangerous cities in America, we're doing something fundamentally wrong. We're not focusing on the obvious. The data doesn't jump. It's the same side of town. It's the same neighborhoods, all the way down to the same blocks. We've got to be willing to say we've got to take a much deeper dive. Organizations and institutions have been given millions of dollars to study gun violence. One, one institution got $20 million to study gun violence. Give me half of that and I'll cut into the gun violence rate. Now, one of the other things, we've got to stop looking at homicides. That's not a good barometer of the, of the gun violence issue. We've got to focus on the number of people that were shot. That gives us a much clearer indication of the climate of gun violence, not the number of people, not the number of people that died. So we've got to challenge the system to say, uh-uh, don't focus on homicides. How many people got shot? That's a more important number. We get that because we're in the neighborhoods. We're on the front porch, and we've got to use that lens. Out of that lens, with all of the intellectual capital that we have here at Webster and other universities and, and philanthropic agencies, if we change the lens to neighborhood front porch living room, we would come up with some amazing programs. Our gun violence de-escalation de model came about because we started a yard sign campaign in the neighborhood. Yard sign simply said, we must stop killing each other. Mm. We started getting phone calls. Hey, man, I see y'all yard signs, man. Look, my sister's old boyfriend got a problem with her new boyfriend and both of them about that life. So when they see each other, somebody going to get hit. It's going to be on site. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your sister. In fact, let me speak to your sister. De-escalated the conflict. Three, four days later, 
man, look, my brother got a problem with this guy. He owe him $50, and I see y'all yard signs everywhere. Can y'all do something about that? We de-escalated the conflict. Mm -hmm. After about five of those, we sat down with our staff, and we said, what have we realized? That there are people out there, there are third-party people out there who have information on conflicts that are willing to come forward. So we launched the gun violence de-escalation program. Watch, um, um, the Department of Mental Health heard about it and said, we want to fund it. Watch, you came on board and said, we want to be the uh, evaluator. We didn't get that idea because we're perched somewhere. We got the idea because we're right in the neighborhood. The solutions are there. We need the intellectual capital to come in, set up a table on Vanderventer and St. Louis Avenue and study what's going on in real time. We are we we, we come up with evidence-based programs that are obsolete before they hit the street because the mentality changes every three to six months. The social priorities become more and more diabolical every three to six months. We had a 13 year old, a, we had a 15 year old teen, we had a 15 year old girl murdered. We had two homicides last night, but we're too comfortable. When James Clark left St. Louis to go into the military, it's because I saw crack cocaine and many of my friends started carrying guns. And I said, I got to get out of here. I'm not going to be a part of this. I got to go. But I had to protect my integrity. I can't be viewed as being soft, but I was scared. I joined the Army, graduated from the St. Louis Public Schools in June. I was in an airplane heading out of St. Louis in July. Didn't even want to be a part of what I saw coming. I came back after four years in the military, and the neighborhood that nurtured me was totally bottomed out. The young men that were riding skateboards and, and uh, driving their bikes up and down Bacon Street, uh, up and down Montgomery and Grand, were now selling crack, and they calling themselves Crips and Bloods. And they were serious because they had guns. And I'm like, what is going on? The neighborhood that loved me was now destroying the ambitions and the, the intellectual prowess of our young people. And I said, James, you owe and that's another, that's another thing that we've got to come face to face with. African Americans, we've got to own this. We've got to own it. I'll say that again, real slow. African Americans, we must own this. We can't leave it to the next generation. Because right now, we're about two generations behind this thing. If Dr. King was alive today, he would be very upset at us for allowing this to take place, and we refuse to even have a conversation about it. In the African-American community, this should be what every meeting starts with, and this should be what every meeting ends with. Why do we do this to each other? It's a crime. So we have got to refocus. We've got to make what must be prioritized the top priority, because if we don't, everything is in jeopardy. They they have a lot of plans for the Central Corridor and, and a Midtown, and I love it. But as long as you got young boys and girls now riding around with AR-15s at 13 and 14 years old and stealing cars is now recreation, it's not going to stop. This mentality does not self-regulate. It does not get to the point where they say, Oh, we've got to stop doing this. They become more and more diabolical. So we got to get serious about this, St. Louis. We have to get serious about this. Wow, you're clearly very passionate about that, and I appreciate that. And what I'm hearing is a call to action, a call to action for all of us. And um, part of our conversation today was to focus on healing. Uh, and restoration. Uh, and this is a great entryway into the healing process, healing communities. But what I'm hearing too is that it starts with each individual, that we cannot talk about communities, we cannot talk about neighborhoods without talking about the people who are part of those systems, part of those neighborhoods. So um, what are some ways that are tangible and clear that people here, people in our audience who want to get involved, 
who should be involved, uh, because it's imperative that we all are, what are some ways that people can be involved going forward so that we all are part of finding and creating solutions that are lasting, that are sustainable? Well, everyone in this room, I would assume, is 18 or over. So you have the ability to vote, you have the ability to challenge your local legislators in the state for a gun law um, issues, right? So that's an easy one. Uh, the, the, the law reform is critical. Um, a, a term I use in many different settings is accountability buddy, right? When I said I didn't want to come back to St. Louis after finishing my degree in New Orleans, I wanted to stay down south and people were saying, down south for a black man and down south in New Orleans, which was a murder capital of the world when I went to school, does not feel anything like what I feel here in St. Louis and when I grew up, okay? And it was that accountability buddy or buddies that said, you need to come back and give back, okay? Come back in whatever way you can. I started coaching, I started you know, going out to schools, talking to students, helping them appreciate, hey, if little Steve can get out of St. Louis and get a pharmacy degree and do, right, you can too, here's the drink, right? So those are little bitty tangible things. You can leverage your organization to invest in programs like Cure and Victims of Violence, and, right? So use your talents and also ask the question to those in your spheres of influence, what are you doing? What are you doing, right? How are you giving back? Because just moving through this world, getting your own education, I think about people move uh, or migrate to cities and towns, in my opinion, based on three things. Housing stock, the educational system, and health care, okay? And health care is facing a crisis just as much as uh, the educational system. We got workers that are drained, you know, coming out of the pandemic. And then when we talk about in this space of gun violence and just violence in general, because when we talk about victims of violence, it's more than shootings, stabbings, right? It's personal and physical attacks on individuals. It's sex trafficking. You know, the stories that I've seen in my 25 plus years in healthcare are, you know, just daunting to say the least. And you have individuals afraid to come into work because of the gun violence, right? Patients, family members are coming in. It's nothing for us to get a victim of a, a gun incident come in and the perpetrator come in right after them, okay? And so how do we secure uh, the space? How do we effectively support? And how do we counsel the families, right? We cannot do that. We're not equipped to do that without uh, programs and organizations like Cure Violence, right? And so um, those are some quick, tangible mm -hmm. things that just pop into my mind, and we've got to figure out this reinvestment and commitment to our communities and our schooling. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Adams, do you have some thoughts about that? I don't know that I would add anything to what he said. I think uh, what you cannot do is to do nothing. Uh, you have to take some step to get involved in some way, shape, or form mm -hmm. uh, to impact what we see happening every single day. The truth of the matter is the two gentlemen to my right uh, will, I'm sure will amen this. We cannot continue on this trajectory. We don't have the resources to do so. We don't have the human capital to do so. Um, when he talked about counselors, our counselors are tapped out um, in terms of counseling kids about gun violence and suicide and all of those kinds of things. They have to get off the, they, have to, they can't do it anymore. We have to get counselors to support our counselors, social workers to support our social workers, because mm -hmm. they can't do it anymore. They don't, they don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to give anymore. They really don't. And they're quitting and taking leaves at a, at, at a rate that is almost unreal. And so I think the only thing I would add is that um, you cannot sit and do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, vote, uh, write your legislators, get involved in some way, shape, or form, not in a big way, you're not trying to change the world. We just talked here about we can't solve this overnight. It takes individuals in a really small way trying to make an impact in an individual way with one kid, one family, one organization, but get involved in some way, shape, or form mm -hmm. if gun violence uh, or violence itself is a real challenge for you. Uh, in my time as superintendent, 191 kids have lost their lives. James talked about the notion of what it means 
uh, not just for people losing their lives, but I have a school right now with five kids who are in wheelchairs, who were not in wheelchairs at the beginning of the year because they were shot. They weren't killed, but now they're in wheelchairs. It changes the whole dynamic of what needs to happen, and the hospital setting have to give them the support to get ready. And so doctors and those kinds of people have to get them ready to go back in school and the mindset of that staff as they try to address and deal with that. So at the end of the day, I think it's about getting involved. And supporting those families who now have uh, a child that's in that's exactly that they right. have to support as well, yes. the emotional outcome. The emotional of challenges of it and siblings and, and quite frankly, other kids in that school mm -hmm. who are addressing and seeing this kid that they saw on Friday mm -hmm. who's now back a month later in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. so. um, Mr. Yeah, Conkey, we, the last we, point on this. We have got to share the depth of the dysfunction. I, I think that most people don't understand how dysfunctional and how much of a social cesspool the urban core is. Um, when you look at solutions, uh, my military training teaches me you got to go to ground zero and you got to start corrective measures at ground zero. Ground zero is our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're being very intentional on at the Urban League is bringing resources to neighborhood churches. When you look at the urban core, you have a church on every other corner. How do we begin to be very intentional mm -hmm. in repurposing the neighborhood churches to meet the needs of the families mm -hmm. that live in walking distance of the structure? Mm -hmm. So we are, we are now doing weekly family assessments at the neighborhood churches. We are inviting other social service organizations to be a part of these weekly meetings where families can walk to the church to get Narcan because they may have a family member that, that, is, that is dealing with this fentanyl crisis. Fentanyl is just as devastating as gun violence is. But we have to begin to bring the resources right into the neighborhood. When I was coming up, you had resources flooding the neighborhoods. Now our neighborhoods are resource deserts, and we should not be surprised at the outcome. Mm -hmm. Change the input, and you'll get a better outcome. But if we continue to use this 3,000-foot approach, if we continue to just hydroplane over these issues, then St. Louis, we, we have some, we are, we're already going to be challenged. But if we don't at least apply the solution now, then St. Louis, we, we, we will become the next Detroit. It's not a matter of if. Now, that's a cold pill. And we've all got to walk out of here understanding that. We're doing something fundamentally wrong. When you have a 13-year-old that kills a 15-year-old, you got to understand that there is an 8, 9, a five, six, seven-year-old that's growing up in that same home. So what are they going to take when they're able to say, Mom, I'm going outside? Mm -hmm. It does not self-regulate. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's hard to walk away not feeling somewhat despondent about this, but it's also really important to, to know that the solutions lie within us. I think that's what we have to remember, that we, we are not victims. We can be agents of change in the things that we choose to do, in how we choose to engage. Thank you very much for this conversation. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Vincent.